In the sense, giving consent to the right. sin. When the government dictates what religion is, our morals will be stripped. Well, they're setting it up for you guys, the younger generation, to take the hit. They see a church that's on fire for God. This world's got nothing for me. I am a renegade. Can't relate to the things I see. It's like a renegade. I hear a different drum. So my question is, we as the children of God, you and me, the, the true believers who have all the power, who have the power of God in us, who possess the wisdom, why then is the body of Christ, and I'm talking specifically tonight about the body of Christ, why is there such turmoil in this disease called the toxic relationship, and I'm talking mostly between men and women, women and men, not so much friendship, although I do want to touch on it, and all this applies to relationship in general, but there's so many people hurting. Why? Now, I understand Jesus came to heal the sick. He didn't come for the well and the sick, but also Jesus came for deliverance. He delivered. He cast out the demons. He was victorious, and he came with a gospel of victory. But why? Why is it that we battle with this when we have the wisdom? And my question is, does the Bible deal with toxic relationship? Does it deal? Now, wait a minute, David, hold it. Don't you understand? We have a lot, all, you can go to counseling, you can find a preacher and sit down and go to counseling. All the churches have some division of counseling. Oh, wait a minute, hold it. What about those marriage seminars, those Christian marriage seminars? You know, you can get your marriage dissected, uh, you know, reevaluated, restored, redone, whatever. The problem is that the world and the religious system are preaching from the physical, preaching from the carnal. Yeah, I understand that we use scripture or they use scripture or scripture is used. I understand that. But the way I see it, most of these seminars and this counseling, it, it, it starts from the right place, but it ends up being a, a carnal. It ends up being a physical. It doesn't really go straight to the spirit. Folks, we must understand in order to defeat this toxic relationship, this disease called toxic relationship, and we will defeat it. We defeated it last Monday. Tonight, we will defeat it again. Okay? To understand it, we must first understand that we are spirit. We are spirit first and we are flesh second. And what happens is the good-meaning people that want to do Christian counseling with marriages, they come from a place that they want to read the Bible, and they do, and they talk about spiritual things, but they never stay with the Spirit. It seems to drift back into the flesh. And the flesh is something that, you know, we picked up on our way down here. And on our way back, we're going to be giving up this flesh. We started out spirit, we'll end up spirit, and we're spirit in between. But it seems like when it comes to this toxic relationship, the struggling with any kind of relationships, that we keep going back to analyze things and going back to the mental, the emotional, and, oh, let's discuss our psychological, you know, the, uh, our psyche. And, and there's nothing, you know, wrong with it except that if it's just that and the spirit is left out of it, then there's everything wrong with it. There's nothing left. You know, I'm not a saint and I'm not here preaching. I, you know, I struggle. I mean, I, my wife is, is should be giving, she has so much, uh, she tolerates me so much. She should have a star 
on the Hollywood walk of patience, <laughs> you know, cause I'm, I'm a creative person. I'm all over the place. I'm sporadic. I, you know, but at the end of the day, we've got to come together in the spirit. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight is how we deal with this toxic relationship in the spirit. Now, oh, by the way, the devil hates to hear that. He's going, oh, hey, they're on to us. Do you hear that? Somebody's talking about dealing in the spirit. Because do you think demons live? Yeah, demons do live in the flesh because they find people to live in. But they are spirit. And that's how they operate. They go from place to place and things to things, people to people. So we're going to go to scripture tonight and we're going to nail the demons. We're going to be casting out demons, evicting them from these toxic relationships. It's so good to be with you guys, everybody. I'm David. I love you. I'm here every Monday night. I wouldn't miss it for the world. I don't care. I don't care what's going on. The only thing that has to be going on for me to miss being with you guys is Jesus comes back during this hour on a Monday night between 8, 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 5 o'clock for you guys out there in California. I wouldn't miss it. And I'm not kidding. It would have to be Christ coming back for me to miss this uh, if it's up to me. Of course, I always praise God and I thank God for letting me be here with you. But uh, love you so much. Um, hey, Pastor Mike, are you with me? Pastor Mike Spaulding. Hi, David. How are you this evening? Good, brother. Good to have you. Thank you, sir. Good to be with you as always. Yeah. And so my question is, and I know we talked about this last week. And by the way, we got a lot of emails. I sent them to you to pray for the people. Yes. It, yeah. And it, it's shocking, uh, the people that are hurting out there. So, and we talked about last week what a person, a woman should do, or a man, if they're being abused, should they stay in the relationship? And you told me that to go, not to stay, right? That's, that's absolutely correct. You're to get out of that as, as quickly as possible until that spouse, um, well, <laughs> I'm going to use a word here, David. Yeah. Uh, exercises that unclean spirit that has taken up residence or in the least is oppressing wow. because you, you're spot on when you're talking about someone who's abusive, whether it's verbal, physical, and continues to be abusive, that goes beyond just uh, uh, counseling to fix that. There's spiritual warfare going on there, and there's an unclean spirit that has attached itself to that spouse, and it needs to be dealt with. Wow. You know, on that subject, Scripture does say that uh, when 1 Corinthians um, uh, 7.13, it says, if a woman has a husband who is not a believer, he is willing to live with her, uh, she must not divorce him. Now, it also says in Scripture not to be unequally yoked, okay? I personally believe that scripture is not just for business relationships, friends. I personally believe that's for everything, uh, spiritually, uh, unequally yoked. So if that's true, how do we digest if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not. How do we deal with that? Can you give me some insight? Sure. Yeah. So, Paul, remember, 1 Corinthians, the... The purpose of the letter is, is Paul is writing in response to questions that they had for him. And we see that all through the letter. Uh, for example, 1 Corinthians 7, it starts in verse 1. Now concerning the things about which you wrote. So we know that Paul is answering questions that they raised to him. And he quotes them, in fact. Uh, the next statement, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. He's quoting back to them. This is what you wrote me. Here was your statement. And then he takes okay. the rest of that passage of Scripture to explain to them his perspective and the commands of the Lord. So when it gets down to 13 and it says, and a woman who has an unbelieving husband, what he's talking about there, remember, Corinth was a very pagan culture. And, and people were coming to faith in Christ, but not all. People would come to faith and they'd be married. So now they had an unbelieving pagan spouse. And Paul is saying there in 13, listen, if, if your unbelieving spouse wants to live with you, then don't send them away. Because the question that they were asking was, okay, so 
now we're unequally yoked. Do, do we need to dump this spouse because they're not a believer? Paul said, no, don't do that. If, oh. if they're willing to live with you, let them stay. And, and that's why he goes through that whole long litany of things. How do you know you're sanctifying your children? You're sanctifying your spouse? All of those right. things. So it was an answer to questions, David. Oh, uh, okay. I've got you. I got you. Actually, see, that, that enlightens me right there. And it's very specific to what they're talking about. So if a, if a spouse is married to an unbeliever, hey, you know what? That's something to pray about. That's something to deal with. But, but if that person is abusive and, the, and you're in a toxic relationship, you are clearly not equally yoked. And you said to get out of that if you're in danger. Yeah, and you can go on down through there. So verse 15, yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. So, yeah. Um, it, so yeah, separate in that case. You, 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 you'll find nowhere in the scripture any support for staying in an abusive relationship. That's a man-made tradition, brother, that's been brought in much to the detriment of people's mm-hmm. health. And I want to get back to the spirit, to the to the demons, and to the spiritual in the moment. But I want to talk about one other scripture. It's First Corinthians six uh, nineteen uh, through twenty. Do you know not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not of your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This right here, Pastor, and I know it's a hard pill to swallow. This right, this is the to me the foundation of a Christian being in a toxic relationship to understand that their body, their self worth is so valuable because Christ died for them that we have no right to drag it through the mud of an abuser, right? And, I, and, I, yes, I would agree let, with that. And to let those demons take advantage of the people now. Speaking of the demons, I want to talk about the end times, my last thing I want to ask you about. Um, We talked about in Timothy earlier, I think it was a couple shows ago, we talked about 2 Timothy 3. We talked about people would be lovers of themselves. They'd uh, be unforgiving, slanderous, having a form of godliness, but not denying the power. In other words, they would just father against son, uh, mother against daughter. Do you think that the toxic relationships we have, even though it's man and woman married and so forth, do you think that's a sign of the end times Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24 when he said basically families would come against families? Yeah, I I do, David, and we're seeing that on the increase today. Uh, I thought of a passage of Scripture while you were mentioning that Colossians chapter 3 and verse 19 says this, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embarrassed bittered against them so don't be angry don't be violent don't be verbally abusive any of those things to our wives that covers the whole gamut yeah now, you know pastor there's people out there listening that say you know what i have been abusive t- let me talk about a guy for a second but, but it could be girls women i have been abusive i have talked bad i have said things i've done things they're there's forgiveness for these people, right? If, if there's repentance, correct? Absolutely, just like there is for anything else, David. The Lord is gracious and forgiving. But remember, folks, uh, Psalm 12, I think. Don't quote me on that. Psalm 12, someplace in there. You can read it on your own. It says that God hates the one who loves violence. Think about yes. that. You're right. Now, see, someone who's caught up in violent behavior may not like it. In other words, they don't like themselves. Because, you know, I know when I do things and I say things uh, to my wife, to my kids, to anybody, you know, we get mad, we say things. I hate that. I mm-hmm. hate the fact that I have you ever said anything, Pastor, that you regret? <laughs> you regret saying that? <laughs> David, I tell people all the time, I'm well acquainted with the taste of shoe leather. <laughs> I mean, you know, I can look in the mirror and tell you just about everybody I'm talking to and talking about, you know, because I've been there, done that. But but the thing that separates it, and I think you'll agree, is that we hate it. I, I hate it. I, I hate the way I am sometimes when if I can't control my emotions and I despise it. But what you're talking about is people that do it. They don't want to control it. They That's don't right. want to deal with it. And they may even love it. 
right? Yes. Yeah, there's no remorse. That's a dangerous, and I would even go so far as to say that may be a, a psychopath or, or sociopathic uh, personality. There, there is hope for the one that lashes out and then they're remorseful and, and they repent of that and they ask forgiveness and they make it right and they don't return to that vomit again. But, but you know, David, you're well aware that there are people out there that they, they say they're sorry, but they're not really sorry because they yeah. do it again and again and yeah. again and again. Yeah, exactly. And now I want to bring it back to the point you originally made that I was talking about at the very beginning. I want to talk about demons of toxic relationships. I've seen these men that uh, have abused these women. I've looked into their eyes and I've seen the darkness in their eyes. I believe, and I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, they are possessed with demons and they don't even know what they're doing half the time. Matter of fact, you know, I deal with them. Um, uh, multiple personalities uh, dealing with, uh, you know, uh, people that have multi I've done a lot of interviews with Russ Dizdar and so forth. And I've dealt with these people with multiple personalities. Do you believe as a pastor uh, that it can be, and I'm talking about in the Christian realm, not just out there in the world, but in churches and it, are there people walking around that actually have demons in them that are married to, to women or men married to women, women married to men? There's demons possessing these bodies and, and women don't even know it. They're married to them. They, can't, they don't understand it. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I was going to say they, they, they don't understand the behavior is probably a, a good way to put it. Um, I don't know that, that demons necessarily want the other spouse to be aware of what's happening as long as they can keep them in bondage they're going to do that and and talking about multiple personalities those folks don't even don't even understand what they're doing david but if, if that's an abusive relationship by it by a normal biblical standard then yeah. the advice that you've given the advice that i'm giving is that you need to separate and remove yourself from that before you are physically or emotionally harmed yeah, and this is, and I said that was my last point. I got to make one more. Um, I'm not picking on programs or marriage counseling. Obviously, marriage counseling, I think it's a great thing, or these these um, events, okay? Because I've seen them. They're major events put on by well-known pastors about marriage and all this stuff. The problem I have, uh, Pastor Mike, is that a lot of these people that have given these and that I know their, their theology, they don't believe, number one, in demons, demonic warfare, and they don't believe what you and I are talking about. In other words, they don't believe that a demon could, could, could uh, possess a guy. They just believe that if they give them some literature and talk to him long enough and counsel him and say some prayers with him, zoom, it's going to go away. So to me, a lot of these marriage programs are just, they're, they're from the carnal. They're from the physical, from the world. Well, they are, and they're based on secular psychology, which is uh, uh, demonism at its foundation. Here's wow. how you'll know, David. Here, here's how you know. Most, even in Christian circles, marriage counseling, uh, what I've seen over the years is that counselors will advise uh, husbands and wives to focus on the other spouse. Don't be so self-centered. Don't focus on self, but focus on the other spouse more. And, and that is a problem, but that's not the solution, David. And here's how you can discover if somebody is oppressed or possessed. The focus in any marriage, husband, wife, the first focus, the primary focus needs to be on the Lord Jesus Christ. He will sanctify and make that marriage holy if both spouses are focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the spouse that does not want to do that or refuses to do that, there's a very good reason for that, Dave. They claim faith, but they don't want to focus on Christ. Guess what? It's because of that demon in them that won't allow it. Amen. And what I, you know, when you said this, it just hit me and I'm going, this is kind of crazy. But it could be that demons love marriage counseling because they're hiding behind it. Because That's the marriage, exactly right. The marriage counseling won't call out the demon. The That's demon, right. Yeah, I love this, man. Let's. Hey, get your demon buddies. Let's go head, head for this marriage event. You know, 4,000, you know, Christians trying to sa save their marriage. Um, Spot on, David. <laughs> so, in, and I will conclude with this. When I started out, I said, we have to, 
we have to preach and we have to teach and we have to speak and disciple from a spiritual point of view. When man leaves his mother, woman leaves her mother and father, they come together. They come together as a spirit, not a not a body. You can't join to bodies, but you come together as one in spirit. So why in the world would anyone think you're going to teach anything other than just the spirit? We are spiritual beings, right? That's right. Yes, absolutely right. Well, you see, you just solved all of the issues with, with marriage counseling today. Just take David's advice and it'll be good. <laughs> Maybe I should just open up a marriage counseling. Well, first of all, we'll just be, I say, welcome in. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to spend the next day and a half casting out demons. Please That's step it. forward. Yes. You know? Amen. Uh, Thank you, Pastor Mike. God bless you and uh, bless your you, lovely David. wife, Kathy. And uh, we'll, if you, I don't talk, talk to you soon, I'll talk to you next week. God bless oh, you. Oh, all right, brother. God bless you. Thank you. Pastor Mike Spalding has an exclusive show on David Heavener TV, the Bible and Prayer Channel. You need to catch his shows. If you like this teaching here, he does amazing teaching. Please sign up, davidheavener.tv. It's just $4.99 a month. You know, one latte at Starbucks, give it up, and you'll sign up on the channel. It's where Last Evangelist is going to be because YouTube will kick us off eventually. Uh, you need to get away from Starbucks anyway. But that's a whole nother show. Um, when we come back, uh, uh, my guest, Rena, we had her on last week. So much chat and so many emails and people with so many uh, issues that they could relate to what Rena had to say. I've, I'm bringing her back on this week. When she comes back, we're going to be talking about how there's forgiveness for the perpetrator, but there's really no understanding for the victim. And is there such thing as PTSD for a victim of a toxic relationship? I mean, I know there is if you go off to war, but have they discovered that these men or women victims of abuse have PTSD like a soldier would in Vietnam or Iraq? And last but not least, the adrenaline that's in a, an abuser, could it be connected to the same I guess it would be called, it'd almost be like a drug, like cocaine. Meaning that when people get angry, it's almost as if they're on a high. It's, could anger be a drug? And could be, people be addicted in these toxic relationships to a drug called anger? Wouldn't we talk about that and a whole lot more when we come back? Stay with me. Welcome to the Last Evangelist crowdfunding campaign. I'm so happy to have you take this journey with me. I'm going to play a, a character named John Rhodes. And I'm an FBI agent. My job is to bust underground churches. That's right, the churches have now uh, married uh, the government. You have the one world government married to the one world religious system. And so you either have the government church or the underground church. My job is to bust the underground church. I go in, I seek them out, I arrest them, and I find out where the next one is. Until one night, I meet God. So with a Bible in one hand and a gun in the other, I set out to find the Antichrist. I deal with cashless society, mark of the beasts, and uh, just the, what's happening, uh, according to Matthew 24 in the book of Revelation, the end times. Also, too, I really want this TV series to spawn heroes. I want to play a hero to the kids. You know, kids really need good role model these, models these days, and I feel like with The Last Evangelist, we could fulfill that need. Now, people ask me, okay, David, fine, you're going to shoot it. Where's it going to come out? Well, guess what? We have worldwide distribution through Roku, Amazon, and other platforms. We have David Hevener TV. DavidHevener.tv, where you'll be able to watch it exclusively. And who knows? You may be able to watch it other places, too, once it kicks off and becomes very successful. So I want to thank you for being involved. Uh, I appreciate um, uh, this time that you spent with me. I want you to hit that button. Thank you and God bless you.